Good afternoon, Kathy. Thanks so much. Uh, happy to be back again this Tuesday afternoon. Hope everyone has uh, something good for lunch as you uh, enjoy your lunch and watch. I know that's what a lot of you do. Um, so moving on, let's go over the agenda this week. Oh, first, let's do that. I forgot about this one. Um, wanted to announce uh, today that we have um, we are getting ready for this year's version of our workplace seminar, uh, Workplace 2024. So this is a conference that Bond's labor and employment attorneys put on every year. Uh, we, we present it in multiple locations around the state. As you'll see, this year we are going to be in nine cities. And uh, so take note of these dates. Mark them off on your calendar. I hope you decide to join us. It's a full day program, uh, really full of um, useful content for anybody doing business in New York State. Um, registration, I do not believe is open yet. We'll update this slide with that information uh, in future weeks, um, but you can always check our website for information. So I know I will be there in Syracuse on May 23rd. So anyone here in central New York, if you're listening locally uh, where I'm sitting, I uh, hope to see you there. All right, so with that, let's move on to the agenda for today. Um, so we have uh, our former host and friend, Adam Masterleo, with us, who is providing a COVID update. CDC released some new guidance recently, so we all want to know how that impacts our businesses. Uh, we have R Roger Bearden back out of our Albany office. Um, both Roger and I will be talking um, about the New York State legislative um, um, season, I guess, the budget season uh, that's going on right now and how that Im might impact legislation that is pertinent to our businesses. So he'll talk about health. I'll talk about labor. Um, then we'll wrap up with a quick update about New York City Bill of Rights. Um, New York, I should say New York City Workers Bill of Rights um, that is now in effect that um, and Mallory, who's in our New York City office, will tell us about that. So that's a quick overview of what we're going to cover today over the, the next approximately 45 minutes. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam, um, who if I is right behind that wall, actually, we're right next to each other. Um, we can almost hear the echo. So anyway, Adam, take it away. Kristen, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be with everyone today. And it's fitting that uh, the CDC updated its guidance almost four years exactly after the COVID pandemic really started to hit. The United States. So where we were and where we are now, um, it, it's really interesting to see the pro progression. So let's start off, if you could, Kathy. Um, as many of you know, on March 1st, that was a couple of Fridays ago, the CDC issued its updated respiratory virus guidance. So for those of you who like to look at the uh, PowerPoint slides that are posted on our website, I have included a lot of hyperlinks in this presentation, so you will be able to get to the virus guidance by clicking on that in the PowerPoint. But uh, getting down to the specifics, what the respiratory virus guidance did was it uh, provided, and, and I quoted a couple of passages here, it provided practical recommendations for a range of common respiratory viral illnesses, including COVID-19, flu, and RSV. So before what we had was COVID-19 specific guidance from the CDC, which has now been replaced uh, with this respiratory virus guidance applicable to all of these different respiratory illnesses. What the guidance says is that, among other things, is that individuals uh, should stay home and away from others if you have a respiratory virus, if you have respiratory virus symptoms that aren't better explained by another cause. Importantly, uh, this guidance isn't necessarily applicable if you test positive for the flu or if you test positive for COVID or RSV. It's applicable if you have respiratory virus symptoms that aren't better explained by another cause, whatever that means. Um, the guidance says that if you do have these symptoms, you should stay home and you can return to normal activities when for at least 24 hours, both of these two things are true. Symptoms are getting better overall, and there's no fever without the use of, of uh, fever-reducing medication like uh, ibuprofen or aspirin. So I think all of you saw the, the change here. The former guidance was COVID-specific, and it required isolation for five days following a positive test. That is no longer the case, uh, according to this new guidance. You have to stay 
home and away from others until those two uh, conditions are met. Next slide, please. In addition, the guidance says that after you return to normal activities, you have to take additional precautions over the next five days. And it, and it gives examples such as masking, physical distancing, physical distancing, hygiene precautions, et cetera. These are not requirements. The, the guidance says that they are just recommendations. Um, if somebody develops a fever or starts to feel worse after they return to working or return to their uh, normal activities, they should restart the process over again, according to the guidance. There are some handy charts that are located in the guidance, um, which provide, you know, uh, pictures like the one I've included here. This is this is coming right from the guidance that shows the duration varies for how long someone has to stay home. The fever ends, ends symptoms getting better for 24 hours, then you can go return to your normal activities. Next slide, please. A couple of important notes about this updated virus guidance. It does not apply in healthcare settings. Um, the CDC is very clear about that. There is specific guidance related to managing healthcare personnel with COVID-19, which I've linked to there. Um, it is very different and uh, does not uh, comply with this new, this new guidance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the guidance is for respiratory illnesses generally, not specific to COVID. It eliminates uh, the five-day isolation requirement. However, as we'll discuss in a minute, um, it does require or recommend that people stay home for a certain period of time. Um, and we know that the guidance has been adopted by the New York State Department of Health. In fact, there was a release from the New York State Department of Health adopting the CDC guidance on March 7th of 2024. I will tell you, I have possession of that um, advisory that was put out by the um, State Department of Health, but I can't find it anywhere online. So. I don't know where it's located, but I know it's there because I have it. Next slide, please. All right, this is the question that I know you, you all came here uh, to hear me talk about, which is what is the impact of this change on New York's COVID paid leave statute? Um, by way of review, New York has a COVID paid leave law that was enacted on March 18th of 2020 that provides a paid leave entitlement for employees who are subject to a mandatory or precautionary order of isolation or quarantine. And here's the important part for what we're gonna talk about, issued by the state of New York, Department of Health, or any governmental entity authorized to issue a quarantine order. If you go back four years ago and remember when the pandemic first started, individual uh, departments of health on the county, county level we're providing quarantine and isolation orders to everyone who has tested, who had tested positive for COVID or who had close contact with someone who had tested positive for COVID as that was defined. The statute as, as enacted addressed that situation where either the State Department of Health or your local county departments of health were issuing these isolation or quarantine orders. Um, importantly, there was no expiration date on the statute. And as the pandemic progressed, things changed. So local governments, state, the state no longer was issuing these isolation or quarantine orders. So the Department uh, of Health started accepting these affirmations of isolation in lieu of an actual order. So the state went a little beyond what the statute provided. Because remember, the statute says that it's the leave is only for employees who have uh, an order of isolation or quarantine issued by the state, Department of Health, or any governmental entity authorized to issue them. So the state's decision to start at accepting or requiring employers to accept these affirmations of isolation was a departure from the statute, but we knew clearly what the state was expecting of us. Um, by the way, there's a link there to the actual affirmation of isolation form. As of September of 2022, New York began to follow the CDC guidance as it relates to COVID-19 and COVID-19 paid leave specifically. Um, if you recall earlier on in the pandemic and, and through September of 2022, New York State had its own specific rules regarding isolation and quarantine. So as of September 2022, they went away from having their own rules 
and they adapted the CDC guidance um, as it relates to COVID-19. Next slide, please. If you go on the state's COVID-19 paid leave website now, there's a, a number of FAQs, and, and I, this is copied right from there, right from the state's current posting. If you look at the, the question that says, where do I get the order of quarantine or isolation? It says the New York State Department of Health is following the CDC isolation precautions for people with COVID-19 guidance, which provides information to those who tested positive. Currently, only orders of isolation are available. And that is a reflection of the CDC's change a while ago uh, to remove quarantine orders following exposure. So for a long time, the CDC was only requiring isolation following a positive test. So here the state says, if you receive a positive test, regardless of your vaccination status, you had to isolate for five days in accordance with the CDC guidance and obtain an affirmation of isolation. Um, that CDC guidance that's linked from the state's webpage is no longer there. That, that is the CDC guidance that has been superseded by what we got a couple of Fridays ago. Next slide, please. So the question, do employers have to continue providing COVID-19 paid leave? Uh, first of all, remember the CDC guidance isn't drafted just for New York State. And it's certainly not drafted to address New York State's COVID paid leave law. It is national guidance that is applicable everywhere in the United States. So a couple of factors uh, support the theory or the argument that employers don't have to provide paid COVID leave anymore. First of all, there's no more specific isolation requirement. The prior CDC guidance talked about five days of isolation following a positive test. That's gone. Another fact that uh, supports an employer's position that they don't have to pay COVID pay leave would be that the guidance is no longer specific to COVID-19. So the CDC guidance is generally applicable to um, respiratory illnesses, RSV, flu, COVID-19. So it, it, it would be harder for the state to argue that this guidance requires isolation for COVID-19. Uh, in addition, the affirmation of isolation form is no longer current. So if, if you click on that link I provided, you can see that the affirmation of isolation references the five-day isolation period that was in the prior CDC guidance. So all of those factors support an argument that COVID-19 paid leave is no longer required. But, and unfortunately it's a big but here, it's unclear if the state is going to interpret this 24 hour recommendation as an isolation requirement. Remember the state has gone further and further away from the actual text of the law in interpreting it. So uh, the state's current guidance says that you'll, you only have to provide COVID paid leave for three periods two of which have to be based on a positive test. There is absolutely nothing in the statute that talks about three periods of leave. So that's the state administrative agency, the Department of Health, Department of Labor, interpreting the statute in that way. Similarly, the guidance says that if you as the employer tell someone that they have to stay home following an exposure to COVID-19, you have to pay them for that period. Again, there's nothing in the statute that says that but we know that the state has gone beyond what the statute says in interpreting it. So that leads us to be very hesitant to say what the state or how the state will interpret, it, interpret this CDC guidance. So unfortunately, at this point, we can't say one way or the other where, whether the state is going to continue to uh, require COVID pay leave based on this updated CDC guidance. I wish we had more clear uh, guidance for you. I think we've laid out the arguments for why you wouldn't have to do it here, but there is uh, absolutely no certainty as to whether or not the state is going to continue requiring. Next slide. Importantly though, I wanna put in this caveat. Governor Hochul's 2025 executive budget proposal includes proposed legislation that would end COVID paid leave as of July 31, 2024. Kristen is going to talk a little later during the webinar about uh, the Senate's budget proposals as well, which mirror the, the Governor Hochul's in some ways, and she'll talk about how they don't. But um, 
it's looking more and more like the state legislature is going to get rid of COVID paid leave. Um, so even if you as you continue to provide COVID paid leave because you're unsure of what the state is going to do or how the state interprets this, the updated CDC guidance, there still might be some relief on the hurdles. So um, I will say that. Uh, I wish, again, I wish I had more clear guidance for you, but the state hasn't told us yet what it intends to do. So that's that's all I have on that, Kristen, unless there's some questions. Yeah, so I think you already answered this, Adam, but we did have several people just want uh, clarification in the healthcare industry that the five-day isolation um, still applies in that in that setting. The guidance from the CDC still applies. So I, I can't re recall offhand exactly what that uh, guidance says, but I've linked to it in the presentation. So if they want to take a look at it from there, I believe there is still an isolation requirement in the healthcare setting. Okay. Um, you know, another another comment that we got was if you're, you know, obviously in New York State, we have to provide paid sick leave already. Correct. You know, can the employers just say, well, you, you can use your paid sick leave. You're not telling them they can't yeah. stay home. You know, any thoughts about that? I, yes. Unfortunately, COVID paid leave and paid sick leave are two different things. The COVID paid leave law clearly says that the leave provided for under that statute cannot be charged against any other accruals. So you can't charge, if someone is getting COVID paid leave under the COVID paid leave statute, that cannot be charged as paid sick leave. So it's a different type of leave, unfortunately. Okay. And now there's so many questions. I won't be able to get to all of them, but um, we, because the new CDC guidance also covers RSV, um, just want to clarify that that doesn't mean that we now need to give COVID pay for RSV, correct? Correct. That is correct. The statute only applies to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there is no paid separate paid leave for RSV, flu, or any other respiratory illness. Um. Okay, so I'll have you take a look at those questions because they're, they're they're there's a lot of them, and I'm I, I think that's that, that's a few of them. But if you can take a look at those, Adam, and if I'll take a look in between, and if I have a chance to answer them, you know, later on in the program, we will as well. Uh, we you know the, this topic always uh, garners the most questions of just about anything. So okay. understandably, you know, we, we we don't unfortunately have really clear answers here. Um, so thanks, Adam, for coming back and talking about that today. Thanks, Kristen. Yep. All right, moving on. We are going to talk with Roger Bearden, our senior counsel in Albany. Roger has been on the webinar before. Uh, Roger came to us from state government. So he's one of our experts about how the state government of ours runs, especially in the spring when we're in budget season. So he's going to talk generally about the process and then um, offer some insights into the healthcare industry in this area. That's Roger's um, area of expertise. Um, and then I'll talk about the labor aspects. So Roger, why don't you uh, get us started on this, please? Uh, thanks so much, Kristen. And uh, this is very much uh, breaking news, if you will, in, in the sense that uh, the rhythm of uh, budget negotiations in, in Albany are that the governor in January proposes a uh, an initial proposal, which included, as as Adam mentioned, uh, elimination of the COVID uh, paid sick leave, as well as many other uh, provisions uh, that were proposed. Uh, the legislature uh, traditionally uh, introduces um, uh, a negotiating position, which is a, a bill describing their each of the House's um, views of the governor's proposal and any additional proposals um, that uh, they may wish to offer into the discussion, um, all of which is to uh, arrive at a finished budget uh, by April 1. So uh, the legislature's proposals were uh, introduced very late last night. Um, and so uh, I think both Kristen and I and others in the firm have been looking at those to see what, uh, what relevance they may have. Um, once again, this doesn't tell you what the end uh, result of the negotiation and discussion will be. It just kind of gives you a, 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 an update on, on where things may be heading. Uh, so as Kristen mentioned, she'll be talking in just a minute about some of the labor-related uh, items um, that um, we've been tracking. In terms of the health-related aspects, um, as I think we talked about in January, um, there was a pretty substantial set of uh, reductions across a number of um, 
domains uh, impacting healthcare, whether it's from uh, nursing facility, uh, other firms of long-term care, home care, uh, consumer-directed assistance, as well as a number of um, um, minimal growth in behavioral health. Um, in large part, the Senate and the Assembly are, on first analysis, looking to restore most of those cuts, if not all. Uh, once again, this is something where um, one can't read too much into that because there is, of course, a limited base of money from which the budget can be formed. And so uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, really across the board restorations. Um, and that's not particularly predictive of what uh, will end up happening in the final budget. Um, so a couple of um, uh Details, there's a 10% uh, proposed rate increase for hospital services, uh, nine and a half for nursing homes and assisted living, for the behavioral health and developmental disabilities uh, providers. There's um, consistent with uh, their request, a 3.2% cost of living adjustment. Um, uh, I believe the Senate adds in a direct support wage enhancement, whereas the Assembly does not include that. When you see in one area, one house um, introducing something in another house, not introducing it, that's usually enough to put it on the table for negotiation. Once again, hard to tell what the end um, result will be uh, given, um, you know, given the need to make a balanced budget at the end of the day. Um, we had mentioned, I think, previously um, very substantial reforms uh, the governor is proposing with respect to the consumer-directed personal assistance program, which is a form of home care uh, for people with disabilities that has seen very significant growth over the last number of years. Um, there's uh, been proposals going back to at least 2019 to make changes in one form or another. Um, wholesale rejection by both houses of those two proposals um, in terms of um, efforts to eliminate what are so-called designated representatives as well as a, a new authorization process. A little unclear what the houses might want to have happen because um, the rejection means a, a process that has been going on for a number of years would resume, which has also been um, criticized in many corners. Uh, one interesting provision on mental health side is uh, there was a proposal in the governor's uh, budget um, to uh, require uh, rate parity uh, for mental health services and, and substance use services um, between commercial and Medicaid. Um, that is something that both the houses are accepting, um, which is sometimes a decent predictor of whether it may uh, make its way into the final uh, budget. Um, other than that, I think that there's, uh, the other thing to highlight would be the rejection of the governor's proposed reforms to Medicaid managed care. There have been uh, a, a fair number of proposals floating around uh, about either uh, reforming, uh, re-procuring in some areas, particularly with respect to home care, carving that service entirely out of managed care. Uh, for now, we don't really have any tea leaves in terms of where that may be going, though um, the underlying uh, issue in health care, which is the lack of resources, um, is probably going to need to be addressed in the next several weeks as part of the final budget negotiation. With that, I'll maybe hand the mic over to Kristen and see what she has to say on the labor side. Okay, great. Thanks, Roger. Um, Kathy, if we go back to the slides. Yep, you got me. You're way ahead of me. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so um, as as Roger said, last night, the um, both houses of the state legislature released their competing proposals um, and when it comes to labor, we're, we're not really talking so much about funding as we're talking about, you know, actual legislative proposals that New York State likes to throw in um, to this process. And um, so these, I guess they were posted last night, they're available to me this morning. So I want to caveat this, that um, this is very hot off the presses. Um, I, you know, I will update on future webinar um, webinars about these things, but this is our first read of what we're seeing out there. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, first of all, the, the topic that everyone seems to care the most about um, is the COVID paid leave. So as you recall, 
And as Adam just told you, Governor Hochul proposes to sunset it on July 31st. Um, what the Senate has said is, yes, we agree we'll sunset it, but not for healthcare employers. So any facility licensed by Article 28 um, would, would still have um, to, to provide COVID paid leave. Doesn't really make sense in light of the CDC. Well, I guess it does in a way, right? Um, now that I'm thinking out loud, I mean, because the, the new CDC guidance doesn't apply in the healthcare setting, I mean, maybe that's the thinking. So um, the assembly didn't include anything at all in their um, in their budget proposal. So not sure if that mean, you know, you know, if that, that does, that's an important issue to them and they don't, you know, they're going to fight against um, um, against Governor Hochul's proposal. Not quite sure yet. But um, so that's the update there. I should also say that. Um, the Senate released, um, in addition to the actual bills, a resolution sort of explaining their thinking around some of these things. So if they didn't address something, they said, hey, we're open to talking about it. The assembly, that version of um, a resolution where they might explain their thinking for the assembly hasn't come out yet. I don't have it yet. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit flying blind here. But again, Senate says, yes, let's repeal it, but not for health care. Assembly hasn't said anything. Um, another big topic. Um, that I discussed a few weeks ago when I was presenting um, on this webinar about Governor Hochul's proposals was the idea of paid prenatal leave. So Hochul had pro um, had proposed that she would amend paid family leave law and provide an additional 40 hours per calendar year for prenatal leave. Both the House and the, sorry, both the Senate and the Assembly do include the concept of pre paid prenatal leave, but they do it differently. So the, what the Senate said, well, we don't want this to be paid family leave. We think that there could be an impact on the recognition of personhood, um, you know, of fetal personhood if we include this as paid family leave. So instead, we're going to move it over to the New York State sick leave law and say within the New York State, State sick leave law, we're, we're going to provide on top of what you already have to provide for sick leave, an additional 40 hours per calendar year, just like Hochul. Um, they just put it in a different place. Um, the assembly does something different. So what the assembly is proposing is, okay, we like the idea of paid prenatal leave, um, but we're going to just add that as another reason an employee can take um, paid sick leave. And we're not going to give you any extra time. So it looks like all of our lawmakers have an agreement that prenatal leave is important. It's just a question of how they're going to get it done. So is it going to be the extremely generous extra 40 hours on top of what we already have for paid sick, sick leave, or just will it be part of that? So stay tuned on that. Next slide. Um, another issue that I had talked with you about before from Hochul's proposal is um, also another paid and paid leave. We're seeing a theme here, lots of paid leaves, um, breast, milk, breast milk expression. So we already have laws on the books that require you to provide time for this, not necessarily paid time. And Governor Hochul wanted to make it paid time and it would have been, and she's proposing 20 minutes for each time the employee needs to express milk. It's they're sort of reasonable. There's whatever is reasonably required. There's not like a number of times. It's not every X number of hours or anything like that. Um, so Hochul was saying 20 minutes. Senate is saying, okay, we agree with this, but we think it should be 30 minutes. Um, and the assembly just doesn't doesn't address it at all. So we will be interesting again to see with only sort of two out of the three interested in this topic, what will happen. Um, Another thing of note, we talked about manual workers and this idea that employers have been hit with liquidated damages where they've actually paid the manual workers their pay in full, just haven't done it on a weekly basis. And if you recall, there was a, a case out of the um, out of the uh, New York State Appellate Division Court um, that said, no, 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 this is not right. Uh, employees who have actually been paid all their wages shouldn't then be paid damages equivalent to the wages they've already been paid. And so um, at the same time, this court decision came out, Hochul proposed legislation saying, we're gonna just clarify state law that there are no such liquidated um, damage provisions. Both houses, um, both the assembly and the Senate um, do not include this in their proposal. Um, the Senate in its resolution said, it's open to further discussing it. Um, don't know what the assembly is going to say yet, but this is really, really interesting because I think everyone agrees that this is a kind of an insane interpretation of the labor law that you have to pay 100 percent liquidate liquidated damages when you paid someone biweekly instead of weekly. But 
who knows, right? So um, that's what we have on that issue. Uh, another thing that uh, that caught my interest uh, was not in Hochul's proposal, was not in the assembly, assembly proposal, but the Senate is proposing to reduce the period that a striking worker can receive unemployment benefits to just a one week waiting period. It's currently a two week waiting period. This feels like a little bit of an outlier. It's sort of sitting out there all by itself. Um, we haven't heard anything else about it. So, you know, I'm not sure that this is something we're going to see make it through the process, but thought I'd mention it because it's directly related to labor, obviously. Next slide. Okay, so this is the I guess what the big one is for me. So you, uh, when I pres when I, we talked before about this, I noted that Hochul um, is proposing substantial increases in the amount of money um, that employees get when they take short-term disability. It hasn't been increased since I think 1989. It's maximum of $170. It's peanuts compared to what that was worth in 1989. So Hochul presented a, um, a gradual increase over I believe five years. Both the Senate and the Assembly, through their legislative proposals, signal that they're interested in seeing this change as well. Both have their own proposals. All three proposals are different. From what I'm hearing, there's a lot of debate around this subject in Albany. Even within the Senate, there's disagreement about how this should be done. There's many advocacy groups very vocally at um, pushing for this, the NYCLU, um, and another organization whose name escapes me right now, um, but very actively discussing this. So I feel like I'm, I can't predict with certainty, but my sense is that there will be some change to our short-term disability law in the, in the form of increased benefits. It's just a question of how fast, how much, how soon, how, you know, how, you know, how gradual, all of those things, right? So, um, what I did here on the slides is I, I address the Senate provision first, and then I'll address the assembly. What's interesting about the Senate proposal is that it goes it goes much further. So it doesn't just say, okay, we're going to increase the dollar amounts. It says not only that, we're going to make disability leave sort of on the same playing field as PFL. So under PFL, paid family leave, there's job protection and reinstatement rights and a whole process where if you don't reinstate, there's a hearing. Um, it's job protected leave, just like FMLA. State disability leave technically is not job protected. That's, you know, employees have the FMLA protection. I mean, we never, you know, there's there's many other laws that layer on top that make it so you probably shouldn't, uh, you know, um, terminate someone on disability leave, but um, and it's, it's not in this state disability law. So the Senate's proposal would um, enhance job protection um, aspects of disability leave on the state level and reinstatement rights. It also adds a whole bunch of um, ways that employers can get in trouble. So there's a whole a whole list of um, uh, items that are specifically listed as being unlawful. Um, they are provide failing to provide the notice of rights of disability benefits, failing to provide the claim form to the employee when you should failing to timely complete the disability paperwork, um, doing anything sort of in the process with the insurer that might interfere, you know, saying you can't take the leave until the insurance company approves it. I didn't list it all here. This is just a high level sort of first look, but very substantial proposed changes to the law from the Senate. Um, also removing the eight day waiting period. That's an important one that all of you are aware of. I'm sure if you're in the world of administering um, leave benefits, as it is right now, you don't get paid disability until you have an eight day, even on eight days. Now they would remove that. It would be one day. Um, they, they would increase the disability payments faster than the governor's proposal, um, put a cap on employee contributions, which would be half a percent of wages, um, but with a cap tied to um, some other formulas. Uh, but in any case, no more than $2.20 a week. So incre increasing benefits, but capping uh, contributions. Also, there would be a, a temporary waiver if you have a collective bargaining agreement, um, so that the CBA would would be con would control instead of the new the new statutory benefits. So that's the Senate. Uh, next slide, Kathy talks about the Assembly, uh, much uh, less substantial in terms of their proposals around disability. Um, one thing I noted as they added language that would um, enable employees to use disability benefits intermittently. In one or in, in one day increments, so that would sort of line it up with FMLA a little bit. Where if someone takes incremental, you know, I need to take one day off a week for a flare up, 
of a chronic condition, they could now use their statutory disability benefits. That would be a change. Um, but it's only in the assembly bill. So who knows? The assembly also increases benefits more aggressively than Hochul, but in a different manner than the Senate. I didn't want to get into the complex formulas here because frankly, it's a lot to digest in just a few hours that, that since it, these came out. Um, again, minimum, oh, this I thought this was interesting. The minimum payment would be $100 a week for all employees unless an employee earns less than $100 a week and then they would just receive 100% of their pay. You know, I don't think there's a lot of workers, I mean, that's, that's well under the minimum wage, right? So that's someone who works on a very part-time basis. Um, also has some caps on contributions and waiver for certain collective bargaining agreements. So I just think this is interesting um, to see the little pieces, right? So are we gonna end up with incremental intermittent, excuse me, intermittent leave? Are we gonna end up with um, job protection for disability? Are we gonna end up with you know a, an increase over five years, three years, two years? We don't know, but I strong, strong sense here that something's gonna change in our disability leave law. Um, this year. If I'm wrong, I'll let you know. <laughs> Next slide. All right. Um, this is the last slide, I believe, um, much less significant, but, you know, in Hochul's bill, she talked about expanding the ability to recover um, uh, stolen wages. You know, I'm sure this doesn't even apply to any of you because you're so diligent that you attend this webinar. You're not out stealing employee, employees' wages and failing to pay them. But for those that are, um, are doing so. Um, the Senate added another provision that said that employees could go after sh um, shareholders of non-public corporations to hold them personally liable. So that's really interesting. And then the Senate also wants to add a dedicated recurring revenue stream for Department of Labor to be able to enforce um, wage theft. So that, and it would be funded by employer penalties. You know, that could have some impact on even the most compliant employer, just in terms of, you know, enhancing DOL's enforcement um, capabilities. Maybe we would see greater enforcement, maybe we would see more audits, you know, if that were to occur. Um, assembly didn't have anything on the wage theft laws. And maybe there is one more slide. I don't remember. <laughs> Kathy, is there one more? Oh, there isn't. Okay, so that's what I have. This was, again, very a quick analysis this morning of these uh, of these bills. We're going to continue to watch it throughout March. Who knows if they'll meet their April deadline? Um, but I'm, I, you know, I do anticipate we'll have a further presentation on where we ended. You know, as soon as as soon as it's all completed and signed. Uh, any questions? Let me know. And I'm going to turn it over now for our final um, final presentation. Looking at the clock here, we're doing good. We've got five more minutes. Um, Mallory Campbell is an associate in our New York City office, and we just have one final topic here that's kind of New York City centric. It's um, about the New York City Workers Bill of Rights. So Mallory, um, let us uh, go right ahead. All right. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. So as Kristen mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the New York City Workers Bill of Rights. Um, this applies to employers who have employees in New York City. Um, on March 1, 2024, New York City's Department of Consumer and Workplace Protection released its newly expanded Workers' Bill of Rights. And um, Kathy, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, you'll see it's available here on this website. Um, the Bill of Rights is a comprehensive guide that outlines the rights afforded to individuals in the workplace in New York City. So it provides information about city laws, such as paid safe and sick leave, temporary schedule changes, and commuter benefits. Um, it provides information on state law, such as New York paid family leave and workers' compensation under New York law. And it also provides information on federal laws, such as the Family and Medical Leave Act and the right to organize under the National Labor Relations Act. The rights, the rights outlined in this document cover not just employees, but also independent contractors, as well as prospective employees. Um, so for example, there's information about pay transparency, salary history ban, and the use of automated employment decisions, which pertain mainly to prospective employees. And there's also information about the misclassification of workers for independent contractors, as well as a statement that New York City's anti-discrimination law covers independent contractors in addition to employees and job applicants. The Bill of Rights also includes information for these individuals on who to contact with questions 
and how they can file a complaint. So by July 1 of this year, employers must provide a copy of this Bill of Rights to each of their current employees. Thereafter, the Bill of Rights must be provided to each new hire on the employee's first day of work. If the employer uses um, a website, internet, um, an application, phone app, something like that, that they use to regular, regularly communicate with their employees, then the Bill of Rights must be posted there as well. Um, the Bill of Rights must be provided in English, and it also must be provided in any other language that's spoken as a primary language by at least 5% of employees. Um, so you'll see in the top right-hand corner of this webpage, there is um, a little link that says translate, and you'll be able to translate the Bill of Rights into a number of different languages. Um, if any of your employees' primary language is not provided in that language, then you're not um, required to provide it. They're not asking you to translate it. Um, if there's not a translation available, you don't have to provide it. Uh, next slide, please. So also by July 1, 2024, employers will be required to post this poster in a conspicuous location that is accessible and visible to employees. Um, you'll see on this poster, there's a QR code. That QR code will take you to that web page um, that was on the previous slide that contains the Bill of Rights. Employers that fail to adhere to these requirements will be subject to a $500 penalty, but first-time violators will be given a 30-day window to cure any violation. Um, that's all I have on this topic at this time. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Hi, Mallory. Thank you. Um, we do have one question, uh, so I'll, I'll put it right to you right now. Um, someone posted that they have, are on the New York City website, but they don't see the Bill of Rights document. Do you, can you give any direction on where to find that? Yeah, so unfortunately, they don't have it like as an actual PDF. So, Kathy, if you could go back one slide, please. Um, so, unfortunately, it's not, you know, a nice comprehensive PDF. It's just this web page. So if you click on expand all, it will expand all of the laws. And the way I've been doing it is if you control P, it turns it into a PDF, but um, it would be a lot more ideal if they provided an actual PDF. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So they don't make it easy is what no, we're saying not, here. Not yeah, but it is early. Um, this was just just posted. So you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they make it a little more accessible in the future. Yeah, I mean, that seems to make sense. So uh, give it some time. So great. Well, Mailer, thank you so much for that overview. Um, thanks to the rest of our presenters. Thanks to our attendees. Um, here are the contact, here are the emails um, for our presenters today. So if you have any specific questions for each of our presenters, go ahead and contact them directly. Um, we, if we didn't get to some of your questions, we'll take a look at them afterwards and, and try to follow up with you. Um, please, in your surveys, please give us uh, suggestions for future topics. As the person responsible for building agendas every other week, I really need ideas. So um, <laughs> we try to do current things, but there's not always something current in the news. So please give us ideas for topics. We want to know what you want to learn about. Um, appreciate you being here, and we will see you again on a Tuesday. Thank you.